So, in the last class I started discussing about advanced spectroscopic technique and I elaborated you on the different basic principles which are used for these techniques. To remind you that we normally use these techniques for spectroscopy analysis of different inorganic and organic compounds. So, whenever an isolated molecule suppose is subjected to any kind of radiations and uh, it is uh, excited form a state suppose if I write it properly E 1 to E 2 it, it undergoes transition by application of any kind of radiation does not matter what is the wavelength of the radiation. And in such a case uh, the molecule or the species rather will come back from the high energy state E 2 to E 1 by emitting certain radiation. And if you know what is this frequency of the radiation we can cal relate this as this one like this. That means, the emitted energy of the radiation H nu is equal to the modulus of E 1 minus E 2. Right. So, therefore, I can always write this one as H c mu bar equal to mod E 1 minus E 2. So, where mu bar is nothing but the inverse of frequency that is c by lambda sorry 1 by lambda and that means, it can be written as H c by lambda equal to mod E 1 minus E 2. So, therefore, depending on the type of interactions the radiation will have on the molecule on the species we can either have absorptions or we can have otherwise what is known as the emission. So, either we can have absorption spectroscopy or emission spectroscopy. Now, depending on uh, the kind of energy levels if u 1 suppose is greater than e 2 then we can have we will have absorption. That means, if the molecule is going to the higher energy state to lower energy state by absorbing certain amount of energy then it is absorption. On the other hand that means, this is absorption. On the other hand if the molecule is uh, going to higher energy state to from the lower energy state by absorbing the, uh, the radiation and it comes back that is if E 1 is less than E 2 we call it emission. So, we can we can measure the spectros spectroscopic uh, measurement you can do either in absorption state or in emission states. That is the way normally the spectroscopic techniques are done. Now, the kind of radiation which will be emitted from the absorb by the by the species will be depending on the what is the re input radiation we are applying. So, therefore, depending on input radiations different kind of situations can be is possible. I have shown this slide in the last class I am showing you again. If we have suppose very high frequency uh, like 10 to the power 6 10 to the power 8 or rather we can have if we have radio frequency like wavelength starting from 10 meter to 100 centimeter we will have normally change of electronics uh, change of nuclear spin okay, can be changed nothing will happen to this molecule or the atomic species present. On the other hand if the energy levels are little increased from a uh, frequency level from 10 to the power 10 to 10 to the power 12 hertz that is obviously corresponding to the energy level increase that is if we go to microwave regions and then we have change of orientation of the molecules okay, or change of configuration of the molecule. Infrared can also lead to change of configuration of the molecule and in the visible the ultraviolet region you have change of electronic distributions or rather you can always have some kind of rotations or uh, transition between the different electronic states which can which can be inclusive of the rotations. Finally, in the uh, ultraviolet or X-ray regions transition can occur which can ionize or dissociate a certain molecules that is what is shown here in the X-ray and if you apply very high energy that is gamma ray okay, or frequency to power 18 very high frequency then you can have change of nuclear configuration itself like you can have the nuclear pieces can undergo transitions. So, by using a host of radiation starting from radio waves to the gamma rays one can get 
a large number of spectroscopic uh, studies done. In the students lecture what I am going to do is uh, is we are going to analyze or look at it the most simplest one and the most you know widely used and the oldest technique in the spectroscopy is called EV visible. That is if we use the radiations which wavelengths are in the range of visible or near uh, what is called visible but in the ultraviolet range. So, I have shown the whole spectrum starting from gamma ray to the radio frequency 10 to the power minus uh, 10 to the power 20 rather uh, 20 to the power 18 to 10 to the power 4 second or uh, hard and uh, UV visible comes very small 10 to the power you can see this frequency 10 to the power 16 or the power 8 14 that means the wavelength should be a couple of hundreds nanometers it will be something like 180 to 460 or 70 nanometers in that range. And visible we know it consisting of large number of wavelengths like red to or what is called red to violet, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo and violet 7 colors are possible. Now to give a very simplistic perspective of this ultraviolet uh, and the UV visible spectroscopy, I will just start from a very basic thing. You know the obvious difference between many compounds is color, right. To give an example chlorophyll is uh, what is called green. On the other hand very complex ones like say 2, 4 dry nitrophenyl hydrogen or derivatives of any alkyl ketones are okay, uh, basically bright yellow kind of on the other hand quinine is yellow. So, this is these are the general difference of the color of different compounds. Now, obviously the you have already learned in your different courses that why different materials or different chemicals show uh, different kinds of color. Well, that is uh, basically that is how our eye perceives or eye basically sees an object and then she determine the color, sky is blue, sun is yellow like that. So, why it is so? Because the uh, light reflected on the surface of any solid uh, or basically or passing through a liquid, it comes back to our eyes and we see the particular wavelength of light coming from a particular substance and that wavelength are really corresponding to different colors like red or maybe yellow or maybe your violet in the whole visible spectrometer. This is what we know. So, that means our eye is basically a spectrometer acting as a spectrometer to be to be frank our eye can actually distinguish different colors coming from different objects. So, it is probably the simplest spectrometer one can always tell that eye can be of many things it is basically a camera is basically a, a, a called phenol camera or we can I can always tell that from the, from the spectroscopic point of view this is a spectrometer simply spectrometer. So, and then there are many compounds which are colorless correct there is no color. So, that means where light falls on them no light basically comes to our eyes in the wavelength range in the visible. So, that we can do not see any color. So, most important aspect will be those objects which are which looks colorless they are emitting lights or emitting radiations whose wavelengths does not fall in the the normal uh, visible spectrum uh, the spectrum range like red to violet. So, they may be coming in the near alpha red alpha ultraviolet regions so, so we do not see them or we do not see their colors we rather see them colorless. Now, when a light white light that white light consisting of all kinds of uh, this wavelengths starting from red uh, different colors starting red to, to the palette is passing through or basically getting reflected by any color substance. And we know that a, a basically a characteristic portions of the mixed wavelengths okay, all this mixed wavelengths 1 200 to 300 to maybe 600 nanometers is absorbed remaining portions of the light remaining light will assume the complementary color obviously, whatever will be absorbed will not be seen and whatever that those color the light those wavelengths will not come to our eyes. So, whatever will not be absorbed by that color substance 
will come back to the eyes. So, we say the complementary colors. So, that means we can say that if something is absorbed in the 420 to 430 nanometers, it will render yellow. Like uh, if something uh, absorbs light uh, in the wavelength 500 to 520 nanometers, it will be looking red, higher lens reds that we know why that is why the red signals are used in the traffic lights and, uh, and therefore, there are many uh, so on. Okay. So, early human beings actually seen these different colors and that is the that is how the story actually goes and use this for the decorative purposes you know many of these are organic minerals. In fact, we, we know that many stones which are used for jewelry purposes are colorful because of the color. There are many organic substance like dyes they are also color. So, that question is now this is all well known to all kinds of students even the school students also they know. Question is that how can I use this concepts as I said uh, this using lights to determine molecular or electronic transitions in the uh, in the real uh, what is called scientific purpose. And uh, so, that can be done you know by using common feature of these color compounds whichever displays uh, or whatever I have told you told you is basically a system which is extensively conjugated pi electrons. You know probably the electronic structure there are sigma bonds, pi bonds and uh, other bonds. So, these are the pi electrons which absorb the radiations in the visible range and that is why you see a different colors. So, this is all very uh, typical of many spectroscopic techniques and this uh, I will discuss and I will discuss different parts of that. Now, as I showed you that uh, uh, I will show you the visible spectrum in detail manner ultraviolet falls in the 190 to 400 nanometers, violet is 400 to 420, indigo is 420 to 440 and red is very high wavelengths 620 to 770 nanometers. So, that means red will have very sp or the smallest frequency from ultraviolet to red. So, what are the different things UV visible spectroscopy can do? Well, UV visible spectroscopy as I said at the outset can be used for, for determining the different molecular transition or electronic transition rather in the organic molecules like outer electron binding transitions, conjugations which we will discuss in detail or visible ones can be used for metal or ligand state in solutions like d orbital transitions. Okay. And uh, the end of this lecture if I will discuss about the instrumentation also. So, uh, to give you a bit better idea, UVL spectroscopy is routinely used in many of the analytical chemistry labs. If you, if you just walk in many analytical chemistry labs, people use this nowadays. In fact, in metal science also those who people study different kind of nanoparticles and solutions, we use extensively visual spectroscopy. And we can actually do both quality qualitative study and the quantitative study. Uh, like tension metal science, we know that they show different kind of colors because of the d electron transitions and uh, then similarly uh, there are many others. So, solutions transitions uh, solutions of tension metal science are colored okay, uh, that means they absorb visible lights because electrons with these metal atoms can be excited from one electronic state to one another electronic state that is for sure. So, that because we know that the color is because of the electronic transitions from electron transition from the uh, from the lower energy to the higher energy. So, that means we can actually determine what is the exact electronic state uh, and this uh, can be uh, basically affected by different and then you know that different this colors also can be affected by different pieces like uh, different ligands. Okay. Uh, to give example copper sulphate CuSO4 and uh, 5H2O this compound basically is very light blue, we know that we all of you use copper sulphate in the uh, school days for doing experiments. If we add ammonia to it in H 3 it becomes uh, in the color is more light or rather the blueness of the copper sulphate increases and that means there is a change in the wavelengths where the absorption maximum happens. So, we can actually if we plot the absorption versus wavelengths A versus wavelengths. So, at a very high absorption wavelength lambda max we will see high absorption 
and this lambda max will tell us the electron tensions. Similarly, organic compounds uh, like uh, DNA, RNA, those are very high conjugations, absorb light in the UV, UV region or maybe visible regions. Solvent of these uh, this determinations are often water or water solution, we know that ethanol can be also be used. So, that, that means the, uh, the absorption in the, in the ultraviolet and near ultraviolet in the visible spectroscopy region, visual re wavelength region can be used to study this kind of features. And uh, to tell you the exactly the ultraviolet absorption process, let us look at that. So, we know that as I told you there are different kinds of ball sigma 1 pi bonds. So, we can have sigma from bonding orbital to the uh, anti bonding orbital or sigma to uh, anti bonding pi orbital transitions, they are very high energy, only accessible in vacuum ultraviolet that is when wavelengths are less than 150 nanometers not usually observes in the ultraviolet visible spectroscopy. On the other n to sigma star, we will discuss about n and sigma and pi in detail in a moment's time or sig uh, pi to sigma star transitions, they are actually bonding to non-bonding transitions, all the stars trans corresponding to non-bonding transitions that is lone pair electrons. Normally, wavelengths uh, where this absorption is maximum falls in 250 to 250 nanometer region or you can have like n to pi, uh, pi star or pi to pi star transitions most common observed in organic molecule these transitions. And uh, they are observed with lone pair compound lone pair and multiple bonds normally in a little higher wavelengths 200 to 600 nanometers. Any of these requires incoming photons to be matched in the energy the gap corresponding to transitions from the ground state to the excited states like from n to the pi star. Energies correspond to a one photon of 300 nanometer slides are basically uh, 250. Now, visible region of spectrum obviously corresponds to the energy levels from 36 to 72 kilocalorie per mole, right. Now, in the near visible regions it will be high, so therefore, energy will be near with this is visible, the near visible it will be little high, so this will be approximately. 143 kilocal per mole and uh, in that case you know this uh, this energies or the energies do not these are all sufficient enough to promote or excite a molecular transitions these are very high sufficient enough to promote this kind of transitions and observe and so therefore, uh, we, ob we normally can use this as a transition. So, to give you some even better idea let us know that molecules have quantized energy levels from quantum mechanics you have already studied and you know. Then you have energy and there are different energy levels ok. And if I apply certain energies like UV or visible spectros uh, UV or visible range, then you can see the transitions happen from this level to this level ok. So, whenever this, uh, this uh, excited state will go back to the ground state there will be emission and emission will correspond to certain wavelengths. And uh, sometimes you know each electronic levels can be thought of associated with many vibration energy levels like this, these are vibration energy levels e within each you can see there are different vibration energy bands ok. And they are studied in IR infrared spectroscopy which we will discuss after some time. And you can have rotation energy level also electronic, electronic state can ro get rotated also. So, therefore, you one can determine this, these transitions. So, what are the natures of this absorption just now I told you like one example is sigma to by pi to pi star transitions from ethylene so at about 170 and it can be calculated actually using this software and like this. This is the homo pi u homo means uh, homo lumo as you know high uh, occupied molecular orbital and uh, you can have a lumo lowest occupied uh, molecular orbital. And you can see it is going from bonding molecular orbital to the anti bonding molecular orbital that is pi to pi star. If I apply 170 millimeter uh, nanometer photon, uh, these transitions can be easily detected, this is absorbed. So, one can actually show that in different charts and uh, like they can see there pi, pi, pi n, then there is a high anti bonding orbitals. So, you can have different transitions from pi to this pi or pi to n or vice versa and then n to pi star or you can have this type also like reversible transitions 
uh, or you can have n to pi star others are reversible. So, all kinds of different transitions possible this happens at lambda max of 218 this happens at lambda max of 320. And uh, so, this is in a nutshell what happens in ethylene molecule ethylene is we know that this is C C H 2 H 2 that is C H uh, C 2 H 4. So, there is a double bond here and this is what is shown there. Well, so if I consider the total internal energy of the molecule to be simplistically that may consisting of E tans that is electron transitions uh, E electrons that is elect sorry E transitions is the transitions then electron transition elective then vibration transitions rotational transitions and nuclear transitions. So, uh, normally electron transitions are determined by UV and X-ray and vibration also are infrared and are this that is I have just told also and this is a different energy level that I have shown you. So, in UV and visible spectroscopy this is the uh, interaction of the molecules and absorption of proton results in electron transitions I have also told. What is most important thing is that this ones are used to detect the presence of chromosphere like dynes, aromatics or polythenes or conjugate cations itself. We will also discuss what is these ok. So, there are as I said I will discuss about the this different electronic structure. there are three types of electron transition which can happen actually one is P, S and N electrons and transition cell bomb basically is charge transfer and transition involving D and F electrons are also possible in metal ions like transition metals. Absorptions of these lights like the ultraviolet visible radiation organic and molecular restricted to certain functional groups like homosphere that contain valid electrons of low electronic excitation energy. That means, if you want to have a transitions in the UV visible spectroscopy for P, S and N electrons the, uh, the excitation energy should be as low as possible. Otherwise, because UV and visible uh, uh, not very high energy so it will not happen. This is again shown here this like sigma 2 s sigma from bonding to anti bonding pi 2 p to pi 2 p star bonding to anti bonding sigma 2 p to sigma 2 p star bonding to anti bonding orbitals. And uh, if I want to show in a detail this is what has shown here this is the sigma bonding orbital pi bonding orbital or n non bonding orbital then pi star anti bonding sigma tau is anti bonding energy level increases this way. So, transitions are like this from n to pi star is this one which is shown here left one or sigma uh, pi to pi star is this one shown there this can be detected by UV visible ok. Ok, now you can also have transition like n to pi sigma star like non bonding to anti bonding or you can have pi bonding orbitals to sigma anti bonding orbitals or you can have sigma to pi star you can have a sigma to sigma star. So, and you know that these transitions require different energy levels. So, depending on these energies available we can basically use different wavelengths of light or UV uh, to have this transition possible. So, that is what I said in a nutshell in a UV visual spectroscopy you actually got to know the exact transitions happening from different electronic orbitals and these are the different electronic orbitals possible. And again this is shown in detail manner ok, so that you can you can even look at it uh, this is I think this is the new bar and this is lambda. So, 100, 200, 300, 400 nanometers up to 800 and this is visible from 400 to 800 and then 400, 200 near ultraviolet 200, 200 is far ultraviolet or vacuum UV which are normally you not used in UV visual spectroscopy. So, we will talk about from 200 to about 800 or 700 nanometers and you can have this kind of transitions in 200 wavelengths you have a uh, this are actually uh, so pi to pi star or uh, n to sigma star possible and you have in 300 level is n to sigma pi star and very uh, high level in visible range you can have n to pi star. So, therefore, if we use this wavelengths we can determine these transitions very easily. Now, let me tell you each of these transitions sigma to sigma is a transition and electron in a bonding s orbital bonding s orbital s is one of these uh, s p d orbitals they are in a in a in a atom. So, electrons an electron in a bonding orbital s is excited to corresponding anti orbital 
the energy required is obviously obviously very high because S is the lowest energy level. So, you have to take it from the S energy state to the anti bonding state is very high. So, therefore, in a methane like you have CH4 in a methane saturated compound only CH bonds are there. So, I can actually write down there there are 4 CH bonds in a methane molecule and uh, these bonds are actually all saturated you know that and can only undergo this uh, sigma to sigma star tensions that means electron can be excited from S a bonding orbital and to the anti bonding orbital and maximum absorption for this is at about 125 nanometers. So, these transitions are not seen because 125 is you know far UV not seen in the visible spectroscopy range they have to be used we have to use far UV or vacuum UV. And if you have a n 2 sigma star tension that is uh, non bonding to anti bonding sigma star saturated compounds like contain atoms like lone pair non mean electrons they are able to uh, these transitions. This tension usually need less energy than the sigma to sigma star. Sigma to sigma star obviously because it is because you are going from bonding to anti bonding sigma transitions saturated. They cannot be initiated by light whose wavelength is in range of 150 to 250. Number of organic functional groups with n the star peaks in the UV region is very small because there is a range is 150 to 250 that range it has to come so that it is small. Now, if you want to look at n to c pi star or pi to pi transition, they are the most ones most is easily detectable in UV visible. Most absorption spectroscopy organic compounds is basically based on the transition from n or pi electrons to the pi star excited state. Transitions fall in the experimentally common regions of spectrum like 200 to 700 that is visible visible to UV. This uh, transitions are needed an unsaturated group in the molecule provided provide the pi that is the ethylene. Ethylene has unsaturated uh, this bond double bond and it has also pi electrons which can undergo transitions from bonding to anti bonding. So, these are the th things which are called chromosphere C C double bond C O double bond this is ketone N O double bond or you can have C X X can be bromine iodine and C C double bond times you, can, you will normally have uh, pi to pi star transitions and like in hexane solvent if this is the maximum wavelength possible absorption can happen. You can have uh, n to pi star sigma or n to pi star transitions pi to pi star at these two wavelengths for ketones for nitrous group you can have a different wavelength regions these absorption maxima and for this kind of C x bonds you can have n to sigma star or this non bonding to anti bonding sigma star uh, or transition that is at this wavelengths possible. In all cases except nitrous bonds we use uh, what is called hexane in this case we use ethanol as a solvent. And this is the in a big this is a table which is obtained from this book uh, Lambert and uh, Verbeet, Crooks, Stout, Schubel organic structure analysis from Magnal publications uh, what is showing you this different chromospheres and the present in different compounds solvent use absorption maxima and one can actually molar absorbities values can be calculated from the Lambert uh, Bias law Bias law rather which again I will discuss. And uh, for those of you who might not have understood exactly what is a sigma bond. Sigma bond is basically suppose you have two nucleus and this is how the electron distribution happens in a sigma bond ok. Single bonds are usually too high and uh, you know it requires very high excitations you want this to go to the sigma star a transition sigma to sigma star transition that is from sigma bonding to anti bonding transitions this is very high we have seen that also. So, we need vacuum UV and then you can have that this is the anti bonding. So, you break this bond between them and form this kind of transitions. So, this is low to high from bonding to anti bonding sigma pi is the orbital is like this you can have electrons distribution in this kind of geometry. And if you want to excite it by using of certain uh, energy, it will go to the uh, anti bonding state of pi star, where there are different states, different uh, things. This is easily accessible by UV visible spectroscopy. And non bonding electrons do not take part any bonds actually, they are neutral energy levels. To give an example, like in a formaldehyde, very classical uh, aldehyde compounds, 
you can have carbon there are two oxygens and there is a double bond here and, and carbon. So, this is like this I can write down. So, there are two electrons, two electrons here, there are four electrons here, two are bonding and two are others and then in oxygen has four electrons. So, we can clearly write this black dots filled ones are basically sigma cross are basically pi and these are actually uh, non bonding type. So, you can have in this molecule itself if I apply energy there are different kind of transition possible. I hope I have given you enough idea of what kind of transitions. So, in ethylene if I want to write it down properly ethylene you can see that uh, this, are, this is the pi and uh, this is sigma and different energy levels I am putting and these are these sigma pi star and sigma star anti morning. And if I apply energy levels all has tension uh, the tension probably has happened because there is a double bond between the two carbon atoms. So, this chromosphere is uh, C C double bond. So, it can undergo tension from say, pi to sigma so say, pi star and giving this much of energy and this happens at this wavelengths. So, this is all known classically. So, one can use to determine uh, this very easily. Similarly, in a ketone uh, these are the non morning electrons which I told you and there is a double bond and there are uh, pi, pi sorry there is a pi and then, then uh, other electrons. So, you can have different kind of tension like pi to pi n to uh, n, n star or pi to pi star sigma to sigma star by putting energy level. And uh, when n to pi star tension is if actually at longer wavelengths, but not as strong as pi to pi star. So, therefore, n to pi star tension is not normally forbidden. In acetone this n to sigma star tension happens at 188 nanometers and n to pi star happens at 279 nanometers with uh, the molecular absorbity given by this value which can be calculated or measure. And I can actually go on tell different kinds of bonds this is uh, saturated carbon carbon bonds what you can see. Uh, the only possible thing is sigma to sigma star with very high energy not possible in UV visible spectroscopy. C C single bond pi to pi star is also not possible. Uh, the n to sigma star in this case is very weak. So, may be possible a 183 UV and then you can have O H group that is alcohol uh, O H all group you can have sigma to uh, pi to pi star n to sigma star n to pi star tension. So, a weak it's same thing is possible in this. To give you a ketone situations, you can see that uh, there are spikes in the wavelengths at 188 when you put absorption versus wavelengths and 279. So, these two are telling you sir, two kinds of transitions possible. One at 279 is basically corresponding to n to pi star and 188 corresponding to n to sigma star transitions. Well, now uh, these are all qualitative discussions. Now, what we can do is that we can basically use Beer's law to quantify. Uh, different kinds of absorption. As you know that when light passes through uh, or molecule is passes uh, uh, subject to the light or a particular wavelength of light is passing through a solution when the molecules are there they can undergo transitions which I have shown you. And obviously, some light is getting absorbed some light is uh, uh, used this absorbed light is used to promote this uh, kind of transitions. So, optical spectrometer basically records uh, the wavelengths at which the absorption happens light is also uh, eye is also an optical spectrometer it also do the same stuff. And then the spectrum which is presented as a shown you in terms of A versus wavelength absorption versus wavelength and it gives you peaks. So, absorption usually ranges from very small value like 0 to 99 percent possible and it can be precisely determined by spectrometer. So, because the absorption of a sample is basically proportional to the number of absorbing molecule present in the solutions. Uh, the molar concentration basically uh, determines the number of absorbing molecule present in the sample. And then therefore, one needs to correct this absorptions by dif considering different kinds of parameters like uh, op operational parameters and to exactly obtain uh, the amount of light or amount of radiation absorbed by the molecules present in the solutions. The corrected uh, absorption is obviously called as molar light absorbing functions ok uh, so molar absorbity and uh, they can be used uh, to determine uh, to, to basically uh, this is determined molar absorbity is determined using this formula which is given here A by B C where A is this absorption and B is this 
path length through which the light is or the radiation is passing through and C is known as the concentration. So, this can be done. So, suppose uh, I will give you an example. If I take isoprene, isoprene is rubber all of we know this natural level is isoprene okay, which is obtained from the tree and it is used for many kinds of purposes. So, uh, and you know this isoprene actually in a dilute hexane solutions uh, if you have like C is equal to 100 to the power minus 5 uh, moles per liter and if the path length B is basically 1 centimeter and then uh, we can use this formula and get sigma to be about 20,000 uh, sorry 20,000 amount. So, uh, so, by knowing this this epsilon so not sigma epsilon we can actually quantify the different kinds of uh, different kinds of absorption behavior by the molecules and uh, it is can be even formulated by this way suppose I 0 is the initial oil, uh, radiation uh, initial intensity of the radiation and this is the B is this path and I is the final which is coming out. So, I by I 0 is D I by D 0 is basically K C by D B or you can say B, uh, uh, this uh, K is a constant and then one can get uh, this kind of formula and uh, the epsilon which is the molecular absorbity can be written by K by 2.303 which is called basically from log and transmission as I said can vary from 0 to 100 and opposite is the absorptions, absorptions can also vary uh, from 0 to 2 percent in this way. So, one can actually get idea. Now, depending on the path lengths obviously, if you have 0 100 percent transmissions, if you have 0 0.2, so one can get percent transmission versus path length this kind of behavior or this kind of behavior and uh, then uh, one can actually use this external standard and calibrate this curve. So, this is the absorption, this is the concentration you can see it follows the linear raw law where R is very high, the, the R is the confidence levels of the fitting which is almost 99 percent or 99.86 percent. So, standard addition method is standard addition must be used whenever you have a matrix because you have lot of other factors which uh, which determine this, this, this absorbity and uh, so slope of this working curve the standard made with the distilled water is different from the same working curve is, uh, so therefore, there are many ways. How do you prepare the standards? The standards can be prepared in different ways like this is stock solution which concentration is known then you can dilute it and get uh, different concentrations and that is why you can prepare the standards. The concentration volume the stock solutions shall should be chosen to increase the concentration of the unknown by about 30 percent in each flux. That is this is the known this is the unknown. So, you add unknown quantity different concentrations and then add up make it up to maximum 30 percent. And this is the response one can see that if you plot C S A and response this is straight line it passes from uh, these through points. So, using this one can actually find out uh, this is the unknown concentration C x as you know A is given by sigma B C, C is this concentration and B is the path length. So, we can write down sigma B C x by B t and this is the known this is the unknown and this is what is known as k, k is obviously written by sigma epsilon b by v t uh, and v t is the total volume and so therefore, y is equal to b x b plus c x a x a is the k v s c s is known and uh, uh, basically and x is the uh, c x and so therefore, when a goes to 0 k v x is minus k v c s and c x is equal to so that is why you have to do. Before I go to the real instrumentation how the experiments are done, let me show you some spectra. So, this is one spectrum uh, electronic spectrum uh, basically shown here. You see there is nothing in the visible range, nothing in the visible range in the sense these uh, there is nothing and absorbed in the visible range. So, 0 one can uh, what has happened is that there are two peaks in the UV range for this whatever compounds have used and uh, they are coming at uh, different values of the uh, lambda and uh, so the one can actually determine this eps, uh, the epsilon that is molar absorbities by using this uh, two different compounds of uh, first of all one can find out from this speaks what is the exact transitions. So, uh, what is normally done is that 
normally uh, if you want to apply BR's law for quantification we need to use very small concentrations and uh, as I said UV bands are broader than the photostatic stand so therefore this is vibration levels are normally superimposed that is not people say. Well, uh, what solvents normally used for UV uh, like water or you can use this very high epsilon you can use uh, CH 3 CN okay, which has 210 C 6 H 12 is hexane 210 ether 210 very small we have a ethyl alcohol 210 hexane also 210 methyl alcohol 210 dioxane 220. Then you have uh, CH 2 Cl 2 235 CH Cl 3 245 carbon tetrachloride 265 benzene 280 acetone 300 these are the different uh, uh, so all, uh, energy cutoffs. Okay, so, uh, uh, now what you can calculate uh, can you calculate the UV spectroscopy actually. So, one can actually calculate by looking at the local structure. So, this is suppose the local structure of certain compound nacinol and acidol and then one can actually calculate the absorption happening you can see absorption happening at this two wavelengths one is uh, this is 230 200. 40, 245 and this is about 275. Similarly, this is another one, uh, this is same molecule, okay. this is sort of uh, change is the rotation, uh, this is the uh, transition we are talking about it from this to this and this to this here. So, one can determine this uh, spectroscopic things. If you have a orbital involves like here, you have a orbital transitions which is shown here, atoms with molecular orbitals contributed most to the bands like one this one can be considered to be this tensions, this one considered to be this tensions, this are all natinol and then you can have this tension corresponding to this one or you can have this tension corresponding to uh, sorry this one corresponding to this uh, molecules going to sigma to pi tensions. So, one can determine that and quantification also I just told you so I do not need to discuss. So, let me straight away go to the spectrometer principles or the how the instrumentation set up. Well, as you can see that this is the, uh, uh, the in a nutshell this is the schematic picture. What I can tell you that you have basically a reference and we have sample, cuvette is the sample crucibles which is used. Okay. Now, you have a light source like this, you can have light source from BV and light source from visible and then falls on the mirror, it passes through the slit and then falls on a diffraction getting passes to another slit, it can be filtered also because you want to use probably the exact wavelengths to be required and then it can basically go to one of this can basically go to the reference beam can go to the reference sample and it will be then focused by the lens one to a detector and intensity will be recorded. Other part you can go to the sample and then falls on the lens and then it will be focused by the detector and gets the intensity i. And then once you know the absolute value of the intensities, then you can use the Lambert's law, B.S. Lambert's law to get the value of uh, the molar absorbity for the particular sample. Well, uh, normally we used uh, quartz as a cuvette, samples obviously are to be very small concentration like in the minus 5 molar and uh, it has to be protected all these tubes has to be protected from stray lights which I discussed in the first class why the stray lights are bad and uh, normally D 2 lamp is used for UV and tungsten lamp is basically used for visible and double beam actually uh, is made uh, makes a different different techniques. Now, there are different kinds of instruments can be used one is fixed wavelength instruments and scanning wavelength instrument or diode instruments the most recent one is diode array. So, in a fixed wavelength instrument you have LED light emitting diode as a source LEDs there are green LED, blue LED all kinds of visible LEDs are possible. So, uh, this LED is actually you can see red, yellow, green and blue. So, this LED is actually emit a particular light of wavelengths of light and then it falls on a sample and no monochromata is needed because LED is actually emits very uh, you know precise monochromatic uh, light and then it falls on a sample and then uh, whatever getting out are detected by photodiode. This is how the fixed wavelength instrument work. Normally, there are 4 LEDs to be used, so the 4 wavelengths can be chosen by this. 
Now, in a scanning instrument, we do not do that. What we do is that your extraction filaments were visible, and you have a D2 lamp that is deuterium lamp for UV. This is D2O, okay, D2, D2 lamp, and this is the tungsten I showed. So, both of them actually comes and passes through the slit, and then you have a monochromator here. How the monochromator works is basically as crystals, basically a Bragg's law. I will tell you how it works. So, uh, there are crystals and then form which you can orient this can this uh, move this one, so that it can fall and when you scan this one only there is a slit here. So, only a particular lens will pass through the slits and it will form the sample cuvette and then you have a photo multiply tube which will determine the whatever radiation is coming out very simple. So, how this uh, monochromata really works ok oh yeah, as I said there are different lamps can be used you can use general lamps also. And uh, monochromatic basically applies this Bragg's law, okay. And uh, this is uh, the Bragg's law n lambda equal to 2d sin theta uh, d sin i plus sin r, you can be written. It has a angular dispersions given by 2i by t as n by d cos r, r is this basically reflection and i is the incident beam. So, many times we write n lambda is 2d sin theta and sin theta is basically the incident uh, the angle but here you can split into like this d sin th sin i plus d sin r. So, that is nothing if r and i are different then one has to write like this. A resolution is obviously given by lambda by delta lambda ok or n a n is extended can be actually extended by concave mirrors uh, in this monochromators. This is what is done here you have this crystals which are sitting there they are actually reflecting the lights at different directions. So, if you scan it out only a fixed element will pass through this cap and uh, holder sample holders this is also very important for instrumental purpose you have a visible for visible use plastic or glass for UV you must use quartz these are all at examples you can have single beam double beam normally single beams are used double beams are normally used but single beam can be used but we have a source picker. The last one is diode array instruments in which you have both the lamps tungsten and the deuterium for the deuterium lamps for the UV and tungsten for the visible and then it goes to a slit and falls in a mirror and mirror focuses it onto the sample and then uh, this falls on a monochromator. This is opposite to what you have seen in case of the, the techniques scanning uh, techniques and then uh, this uh, by this monochromator actually moves and then different wavelengths of lights falls on a 32 8 detectors which each one is a 320 detectors each one is a diode and diodes measure the amount of the uh, radiation which is coming out. Well, uh, so there are advantage disadvantage for the both scanning and the diode array scanning has low spectral resolutions high spectral resolution sorry lambda by lambda delta lambda is very high, but it has a long attack vision time which can be several minutes that is sometime may be problem for different solutions and it has a low through output throughput. So, diode array has a very fast acquisition time because it is diode array is, det is basically determine the uh, intensity of this radiation which is coming at different wavelengths after it passes to the sample and uh, normally it is couple of second in compared to several minutes and it is compatible with online prop that is computer compatibility is there a very high throughputs there is no slits and it is a but it has problem is very low resolutions. So, if you want to go for high resolution you have to use scanning instruments if you want to go for high fast and the, um, the what is called high throughput instruments you have to go for diode array. Normally people have both in the labs normally and this is the extended view of diode array I am showing you these are the 328 diodes which are slid there and after the sample radiation comes out from the sample it is uh, detected there. Well, uh, so uh, this that is all in the next class we will so I will show you some more uh, spectrum spectra from the UV visible uh, results in my lab and then some of the uh, things which I gather from the literature and then we move on to the next uh, techniques that is the photoluminescence.